Okay, so first thing we're going to look at uh, in section 2.1 uh, is what's called zeros of polynomial functions. So let's take a look at this graph and just see what it looks like. I'll just, let's just draw it. Right, so if you have anything else in there, you can clear it out and type in 2x cubed minus 3x squared <clears throat> minus 3x plus 2. Okay, we're going to try zoom 6 and uh, see if that's a good window. If it's not, we'll fix it. Let's hit graph. And zoom 6 is fine. That, that's a good... It's a good one. So you should have gotten a graph that looks something like this. That's a very typical graph of a cubic polynomial. Cubic. cubic. Yep. So that highest exponent there tells us a lot of different things about how the graph could look. This highest exponent, along with this leading coefficient, the 2, that tells us a lot. The other terms aren't really significant in terms of the, the big picture of what it's going to look like. This term pretty much controls everything that's going to happen. The other terms change some of the details, but that's about it. How many times does it look like that graph crosses the x-axis? Three. Three. And cubic polynomials, in general, can cross the x-axis up to three times. In other words, they can turn twice. This is a turn, that's a turn. Wherever you have what's called a maximum and a minimum, you get a turn. So it turns twice, resulting in three crossings of the x-axis. That's a maximum. It's not a guarantee of how many times it will cross. It could cross twice, it could cross once, but three is a maximum. It's like parabola, where you found y equals x squared. Two is the maximum number of times a parabola can cross the axis. It could be one, oh, yeah. it could be none. Wait, how could it be one? If the parabola was tangent to the axis and just came back up, it just touched the axis and goes back. Oh, like just one intersection. With a vertex. Like the very bottom. Yeah. The, the vertex is on the axis. Okay. What is the y value at any point where a graph crosses the x axis? Yep. Zero. Zero. That's why where something crosses the x axis, we call that the zero of a polynomial. Because you're basically trying to find out what value. Could you plug in for x in this formula and get an answer of 0 for y? That's what you're trying to figure out. And the two values are, well, to me it looks like negative 1 and positive 2. And maybe 0.5, I'm just guessing. Uh, but I can find those on the calculator. Okay, but that was, that's what we're talking about finding. Now, I want to show that this is exactly the same as what I have up there. How could I show that what I have factored is the same thing as the 2x cubed and all that stuff up above? Yeah? Uh, we proved that it will, that, that will like, cross the x-axis in the same spot. So you could have two different graphs that cross the x-axis in the same spots. You, you could, I mean, you could have a graph that maybe you know looks something like this, and then you have another graph that happens to look like that. So they cross in the same. You know, I tried to do it, but I wasn't perfect in the same spots. What else could I do to show that that is the same as what's up above? Yeah. Do you just like multiply it out? Yeah. Let's play it. Boil that out and see what you get. So if you multiply the first two, you get 2x squared minus x plus 2x minus 1. Okay, that's the first two multiplied together. 
Uh, yeah. I think I said that. I don't know why I wrote x squared. Thank you. Now, we have to multiply that by x minus 2. Well, start with the x. 2x cubed plus x squared minus x. Now do the minus 2. And let's see what we get. Uh, that's minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 2. Combine like terms. What do we get? 2x cubed. What's x squared minus 4x squared? What's negative x minus 2x? Plus 2. Scroll back up. I'm just looking at my coefficients. 2, negative 3, negative 3, 2. 2, negative 3, negative 3, 2. Perfect. So what we have down below is exactly the same thing as what we had up above. But this is much easier to work with than what's up above, because it's factored. If you wanted to find the values you plug in for 0, I'm sorry, the values you plug in for x, so that you get 0 as an answer, factoring it is always the best way to do it. Because if you have something times something, times something, and it's equal to zero. What does that mean? If you multiply three things together, you get zero. Uh, one of them is zero. Yeah, one of them must be zero. Either this one, this one, or the last one. So very easily, I was able to find the three numbers that I could fill in for x that would give me an answer of 0. Uh, you, uh, you okay. So if you plug in 2 to this last one, you get 2 minus 2 is 0. Oh, okay. But then the rest of it doesn't matter, because this part is 0 times anything will be 0. If you plug in 1 half, 2 times a half is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. And if you plug in negative 1, negative 1 plus 1 is 0. And 0 times anything is 0. Without factoring it, I couldn't have figured out those three numbers. Okay, factoring makes it much easier to find them. Now I say I couldn't figure it out. Well, I could graph it. I could figure it out that way. Negative 1, 1 half, and 2. Those are the three numbers we just found. Not saying at this point you should know how to factor a cubic polynomial. Um, eventually, yes. You will be able to take something like that and figure out this factorization on your own. But that's what we'll, we'll get to. So if you find a number that is a solution to the equation f of x equals 0, just to look back at our last one, we found three solutions. Negative 1, 1 half, and 2 are all numbers that you could plug into this formula and get a result of 0 if you plug it in. Those numbers are what we call the roots of the equation. They're also called the zeros. And if you write that number in a coordinate form, that number, comma, 0, then you've just written the location of an x-intercept. So it's really three different words that mean the same thing. If you plug in a number and you get zero, like just do a simple one. In that case, x is negative 2 is the root. So for that particular formula, I would say negative 2 comma 0 is an x-intercept of this graph. I would say negative 2 is a root of that equation. I could also say negative 2 is a zero of that equation. Linear equations, you really don't have to factor them to find the roots. You can just get x by itself. But quadratic and up, you do. You have to factor. So for a linear, that's exactly what I just did. 
for a linear equation, how would you get x by itself here in general? Yeah, so if you have anything of the form ax plus b, the root, or if you wanted a little formula to find the root, it's negative b over a, which is exactly what you get if you subtract b and divide by a when you solve for x. So for linear, the formula is pretty simple to find a root. If you bump it up to quadratic, you know this formula gets a lot more complicated. Now you have negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. It gets a lot more complicated. And then if you go to cubic, it gets even more complicated. All right, so if we solve that for, for the root, uh, anyone tell me quickly, what do you get? Yes. Negative 3 over 2. Negative 3 over 2. Negative b over a. Oh, okay. So that's the root of the equation. That's the zero of the equation. Negative 3 over 2 comma 0 is the coordinate of the x-intercept. Question on it? Okay. So let's go from linear. Let's jump up to quadratics. And I kind of already answered this, but how many times can a parabola cross the x-axis? Yep. Twice. Up to twice. Twice is not a guarantee. I'm not saying every parabola crosses twice. I'm saying you can cross up to two times. Now remember, if all you want to find is how many times a parabola crosses the x-axis, the discriminant will tell you that. If you find the discriminant, which is the part of the quadratic formula under the square root, if this comes out greater than zero, then you're guaranteed to have a parabola that crosses twice. If it comes out to exactly zero, it will cross once. And if this comes out less than zero, it would not cross at all. Okay, so we talked about those three cases um, yeah. maybe two days ago. Yeah, we talked about zeros a little bit. I think it was something I finished up the next day because we didn't yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, maybe on the next slide, I was in trouble if this was there, but can you show like uh, an example of a quadratic equation that you need to do that for to figure out the number of zeros? Because um, so that's under the square root, right? So yeah. how do you... So this one is a little bit more than what you asked. This formula just tells you how many times it crosses. They actually want the answers. So let's we'll do what you asked for first, and then we'll solve for the exact answer. So you have to get it in the form ax squared plus bx plus c. That's step one. Questions on step one? All right, are we just solving this for the? Uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna find. Right, We're going to find the number of roots first, and then we'll actually solve for what the roots are. First, we'll just find out how many there are. So in this case, what's A? Two. B? Two. C? Two. Okay. So B squared minus 4AC. B squared minus 4 oh, you literally A. just plug those numbers in. Yeah. You don't worry about the rest of the equation at all? Not if you just want to know how many roots there are. And I don't even have to finish this. I can tell the answer is positive. I mean, it's positive 12 if you really want to know. But the point is, because the discriminant came out positive, I guarantee you this parabola is going to look something like that. I don't know exactly where it'll be, but I know it's going to cross two times because this came out positive. So if it's less than zero, it's yeah. no, it's no uh, zero? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're looking at something like that. Okay. If it came out negative, it's going to be, it's never going to cross the x-axis. And if it's zero or greater, it's one? If it's exactly zero, it's one. Okay. If it's greater than zero, that's the case we have right now, it's two. So the okay. case is... 
The cases are greater than zero, equal to zero, and less than zero. And the corresponding number of roots are two if it's greater than zero, one if it comes out to exactly zero, or none if it comes out negative. Yep. Would it be minus 4AC? Yeah, I thought it's minus 4AC, isn't it? Yeah, but remember I crossed out, that's what I had originally if I go back. Oh, that's negative one. I originally had a, well, you can't see it, but I had a minus, and then when I put in another minus with a one, it cancels it out. So let's, let's graph this. So we've got 2x squared plus 2x minus 1. Let's do zoom 6. I guarantee you it's going to cross the x-axis twice. Now, this problem wants a little more than that. They don't want to just know how many times it crosses. They want to know where does it cross. But since they said I only need to solve it approximately, that means I don't need to use the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula would give me an exact answer. But they didn't ask for exact. So when it says approximate, I'm going to use the calculator because that will give me an approximate answer. If it says exact, don't use the calculator, because it will not give you an exact answer. So to find the roots, or to find the zeros, what you want to do is go to second calc. And which option do you think we're going to do? Zero. Probably zero. Zero. And this is a three, you've got to hit enter three times in different spots. The first thing you have to do is pick a point that you know is to the left of your zero and you hit enter. Then you pick a point that you know is to the right of your zero, and you hit enter. So now the calculator is going to look between those two blue lines that are dotted for where it crosses the x-axis. Since there's only one spot where it crosses between those dotted lines, you can put the guess anywhere you want. Just right there as well. And that is one of the zeros. You have to find them one at a, one at a time. So negative 1.37. And again, that's approximate. That is not the exact answer. Second calc intersect. Oh, I'm sorry, not intersect. Second calc zero. Do it again. Left. Right. Do your guess, and there's my other zero. Actually, I'll just put it right there. 0.37 and negative 1.37. So again, those are zeros. They're also called roots. They're also x-intercepts if you write them in a coordinate format. Any questions on how we used the zero feature to get those two numbers. Okay. What's that? Uh, 0.37 and negative 1.37. So what we just did there, that's called finding a root graphically. Now, I don't want you to write this down, because this is the old way you had to find a root. Older graphing calculators don't have second calc zero. So the only way you could find the root was to keep zooming in until you finally got as much accuracy as you wanted. That was kind of a pain. So now, we don't have to find roots using zooming. We just do second calc, and then zero, or it could be called root. On my calculator, it's called zero. On older calculators, it could say root right there, and it's the same thing. That's the best way to find roots graphically. The only downside to it is, it is not an exact answer. So if I ask for an exact answer, 
even if you write down negative 1.366025, no, that's not exact. You'd have to use quadratic formula to get the exact answer. And it would have a square root now, like 5 plus or minus root 3 over 2, or something like that. Wait, was I just talking about the method that we just used? Yeah, that's the method we just did. Okay. Second calc, and then zero. Okay. Uh, can we go through how to get an exact answer with the last equation or this one? But this one, would, I can't because I don't know the cubic formula off the top of my head. Oh, so but the last one would be quadratic one. So can we find the exact answer for that one? Um, let me see if we have enough time to go back and do a quadratic. But um, yeah, we already did part of it. We did the b squared minus 4ac part. thought I did it somewhere. All right, so the method that we just did always gives you the approximate, not the exact. You didn't have to put it down more. There it is. <laughs> There's the b squared minus 4ac. We still have to do the negative p, b plus or minus the square root of that all over 2a. Oh. So we, we did part of it, but we didn't do the whole thing. So I'll see if we have time to come back. Now this one, we couldn't do exact because it's a cubic. In general, unless the cubic comes out to nice answers, <coughs> bless you, like integers or bless you, or rational numbers, you're not going to be able to get an exact answer for a cubic. Um, there is a formula for cubics, like there is for quadratics, but it, the difficulty and the complexity of the formula is like 20 times more complicated than quadratic. It gets very complicated to use. So it's a formula most people don't use. So let's find the answer to this one um, approximately. What do I want to get it equal to if I want to find the roots? Zero. So let's do that first. Let's graph it. So x cubed plus 2x minus 1. Remember, it's a cubic. It could cross up to three times. This one doesn't. It does only cross once. And we want to find that answer. How do I find where it crosses? Um, second calc. Second calc. Zero. Pick a point that you know is to the left. Pick a point that you know is to the right. It doesn't really matter how wide you make it as long as it's in there. Maybe it'll change how fast the calculator finds the answer by like a millionth of a second if you made it a little smaller. But I mean, it doesn't really Hit enter, and there's your answer. So this graph has a root at approximately 0.45. Any question on that? Yeah, when you're doing a cubic, I would never ask you to do it exact unless the answers came out to rational numbers. But even then, I haven't taught you the theorem you need to do it. So at this point, cubics and higher, you're going to be finding approximate answers. All right, so to, to find the exact, you need to use the entire quadratic which we're not doing, or quadratic formula, which we're not doing. For that last one? Uh, uh, to find the exact answer to a problem like that. For a problem like that, you need the cubic. Yeah, no, sorry. yeah, we're not we're not gonna learn that. But for a quadratic, you should be able to do it. And I, and I think we we've, we've done a couple quadratics. I remember the uh, the swimming pool problem? That was a quadratic. So I know we've reviewed at least one or two. There was one in the homework, I think. But if we have time, we'll see if we can do another one. So this is the general format of a cubic polynomial. It's ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. You may not have the a, the b, the c, and the d. I mean, the simplest cubic polynomial essentially makes a1, b0, c0, and d0. Oh, yeah. That's the simplest cubic you can have. 
But depending on what values you have for the A, the B, the C, and the D, you can get different behavior in your cubic. And that's generally what cubics look like. First of all, every cubic goes up and down forever. Some go up as you head to the right. Some go up as you head to the left. Some of them curve back on themselves, so you get kind of like a valley in the middle of it. Some of them never quite make a full turn back, and they just kind of do something like this last one. They just kind of start to turn, never really do it, and then just keep going. But that's the general look of every cubic. All right, so wait, but that, okay, so if you're at max, okay, I'm not going to You can change the size of this, this valley. Maybe it'll, you know, dip way down and go more, more of a valley, but... Again, still the same basic look as that for All this. Right. All right, do you know what value in the, 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 the like expression would change the depth of that little slope there? Yeah, they all kind of have an effect on it. It's, okay. it's a little more complicated. So like you wouldn't be able to tell how many zeros just by looking at it? No. No, I'd have to do it out. It's, it's not like I could just say if B is greater than zero, then yeah. this happens. Okay. Um, it's it's a bit more complicated. So let's look at this one. And yeah, this will be the last one for for this part, and then we'll finish up with one other thing. So let's type in x cubed minus 5x squared. Now that's a problem. I didn't mean to put the 5x squared in the exponent, so I need to clear that. Sometimes it's easier to just start over. Uh, x cubed minus 5x squared plus 6x minus 1. Zoom 6. How many solutions does this graph have for, for roots or zeros? Three. Is there any question on how you would find any of them? You'd have to do them all one at a time? Yeah. But it would be just like we did on um, this one, where I calculated the zero. Except this time I had to do it twice. On this one, you would have to do it three times. Any question on how to find a root or a zero? Uh, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, you uh, we were talking about something earlier. If this was to have two zeros, would it be that the the first kind of hump would just barely intersect? Yeah, it would be something and like then, this. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. Thank you. Yep. And there's all kinds of things going on here, which we'll talk about at some point. But that's the look of it. And then one. Oh. Well, there's one. Or one could also look like this. Uh, yeah. Okay. We just did one like the one like that. One. So no questions on how to find any one of those roots. Okay. So the last thing we're gonna look at. Um, is section 2.2, part 1. And it's on finding complete graphs. Again, it has to do with finding a right, the right window to visualize your problem. So just remember that when you're trying to solve a problem, usually it involves two things. Making an equation and then solving it. Or, if the equation is too complicated to solve, we might graph it like I've shown you. Okay, because all those cubics that I've given you, I don't think anyone here could have solved the cubic that we just did for the roots without using a graphing calculator. 
Just, oh, yeah, how the graphic represents. Yeah, we, we don't know how to do it. So in that case, a graphical representation is helpful. Doesn't mean you can't do it with algebra. I mean, if the calculator can do it, there must be a way to do it without the calculator. Just yeah, this is more difficult or less difficult. Right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at a problem that's going to be very similar to something you're going to see um, on the test. And I think this will be our last uh, last problem. Yeah, we're not, we've done a bunch of rectangle ones, so this this will be our last one. So in this problem, the idea is um, Bill is going to be investing money into two different accounts. Now, investments, when you invest your money in something, like a bank account, usually you get interest. We need a formula to work with. So the formula that we're going to work with that represents this particular type of investment is I equals PRT. I think I write that down in a little bit, and I'll mention what each variable means. That's the basic formula that we're going to use in this problem. So Bill has two different investments that he can put money into. One of the investments pays six and three quarters interest, and the other one pays 8.6% interest. Now obviously the higher percentage is better for him because he makes more money. So He's going to choose to put some money in one of them and some amount of money in the other. Now, you might say, why doesn't he just put all the money in the 8.6 account? If that's going to pay higher interest than the other one. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a reason why he, some accounts have a maximum you can put in them. And they won't pay you any more interest. So, the bank, you know, they do that so the bank doesn't have to just keep paying you interest forever. They limit it. That's how they get you. Yeah. They promise you interest and they don't give you interest. So Bill is going to invest $20,000, and those are the two different options he has. The formula that we're using to calculate the interest he's going to make is I equals PRT. Yep, I is interest that he makes. P is the principal or the amount of money that's invested. R is the rate that the investment pays you. Uh, it is important you change your rate to a decimal. So like 12% would become 0.12. So it's important you change percent to decimal. And T is the amount of time, usually in years, that the investment is going to go for. Is it five years, 20 years, how many years? One year? So we want to find a formula that represents the amount of interest Bill earns in one year. And this is a formula because it's variable. It depends on how much money does he put, and we'll call it investment number one, and how much money does he put in investment number two. That's going to change the amount of interest. But we want a formula where we just fill in a number, hit enter, and we get the answer. And they give you a hint. Um, you have to pick a variable, so they just picked X. And that variable has to represent either the money you put in the first investment or the second. You can do the problem either way. They're letting X be the amount of money Bill puts in the 6.75% account. And if we all do it that way, then we'll all get the same. Just showing you how to change a percent to a decimal. Yeah. Just a quick reminder. So what we want to do first is calculate how much interest Bill makes just in the 6.75% account. Let's just find that. We'll worry about the other account now. P 
PRT. What's the principle or the amount of money that Bill invests at 6.75%? Yeah. Is it 20,000 minus I? Um, what's X? The amount being invested. In which account? The 6.75. So how much money did he invest at, in the 6.75 account? X. X. We'll talk about what you just said in a minute. Okay, so that would be for the other account. Yes. Okay. So the amount invested is X. Rate. What's the rate on this account? Point zero six seven five. And what's the time that this investment is going for? One year. So we don't need to do that. So the amount of interest that Bill earns in this account is point zero six seven five x. Okay, there's one. Now I know they asked for. The total interest, which is two accounts, but we're just finding the interest in this account first. Now let's find the amount of interest made in the other account. What's the amount of money that's invested in the 8.6% account? Yep. What would be 20,000 minus 0 0.0675 interest? Just X. Just X. So X is the amount of money we invested in the other account. Subtract that from all the money you have to invest, and you're left with the rest. So 20,000 minus X. What's my rate? 0 0.086. 0 0.086. And what's the time again? Still just one. All right. Let's um, simplify that. So we'll do... Uh, just do our distributive property. What's that? 19,920? Uh, might have been. Oh, 1,720. So 1,720 minus 0 0.086x. So there's the amount of interest at 8.6%. So now we want to figure out the total. So what are we going to do with the amount of interest he makes here and the amount of interest made here? We add them together. So formula for the total interest is how much money did he make in the first account? Yep. Plus, how much in the second account? All right, we can combine some like terms. So we've got 0 0.0675 minus 0 0.086. That's negative 0 0.0185 plus 1720. So there is a formula that if you tell me how much money he invested at 6.75%, I can fill it in for X and tell you how much money he made in interest. We're going to do a calculation with that formula in a minute, but any question on how we got that? They told us. They said assume X is the 6.75%. If they didn't tell you that, you could let X be either one. It wouldn't matter. And you could you'd get a slightly different formula, but it would still calculate the same result. Any other questions on that formula? Okay. 
So before we yeah, do our last one, remember, when we, we're going to graph this in a minute, but remember, certain values might not make sense. Okay? Think about what x represents. It's the amount of interest. Is there anything that wouldn't make sense in this problem in terms of an amount of interest? Yeah? Negative. Yeah, negative wouldn't make sense. This is not an investment where you can lose money. Right? Simple interest is a formula that you make money no matter what. So negative values wouldn't make sense. Could I plug a negative in for x and get an answer here? Sure. Yeah, I could do that. But it just wouldn't make sense in the word. Okay. So always keep in mind what values make sense in the actual problem you're doing. So it says Bill invested, uh, well, no, Bill made $1,509. And 10 cents in total interest. How much money did he put in each account? We're going to need that formula. So I just want to go back and copy it, and I'll come right back to this. So I need all that. I guess I didn't copy it. Let's try it. So, where would this go? $1,509.10. Yes, I'm just going um, sure. Uh, yep. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Total hey. interest. Uh, yeah, that's going to go in for total interest. So this goes right there. And how do they want us to solve it? Graph. Okay. So one thousand five hundred nine dollars and ten cents equals negative point zero one eight five x plus seventeen twenty. How am I going to put that in on the calculator? I don't think you're going to solve this. Well, it said to solve graphically. You can do y1 as the left side, and then you can do y2 as the right side. Okay, so we got the left side. Negative 0.0185x plus 1720. Okay. And what do I want to do now? Yeah, put a, uh, put a graph at y equals 15. Uh, yep, so we got that. Oh, okay. oh you're already doing that. Okay, sorry. Yep. Just make sure your graph is super zoomed out and find the intersection. Yeah, we got to check that window. Okay. Oh, okay. So, what value would make sense for an x minimum? Zero. What would make sense for an x maximum? Yeah? Oh, maybe 1,500, Um, we gotta go higher than that. Higher than 2,000, yeah? Like 15,000. No, we have to go higher. But there's, an, there's an exact number. Because what does X represent? It's the amount of money we have. So we can't invest more than 20000 Maybe the graph goes past it, but that doesn't make sense. Um, what's the minimum amount of interest we could make? Zero. Now, look at the Y-intercept on the right-hand side. What is it? So you better go to at least 1,720 to see that intercept. I would probably do 1,800. Is it negative? Oh, no, it's negative. Well, it's going to slope down from 1,720. So there's your line at 1,509. There's your interest. Notice that the more money you invest in the lower paying account, the more the interest drops. 
And what do we want to know? Where they what? Yeah, we want to know where they intersect. So second calc intersect. And we get that when we do an intersect. So how much money was invested at 6.75%? Eleven thousand four hundred. How much money was invested at? I don't remember the other one. Eight point six. Eight point six. Eighty six hundred. Wait, so are we finding that percentage? We're finding both. Oh, okay. And what? What was it at? Eight point six. Eighty six hundred. Much interest, how much money did he actually make from the interest? 1509. They gave us that. So he made 1509 oh. in interest. He earned that. Oh, okay. yeah. So we weren't actually calculating how much interest he earned. We were working backwards and figuring out what did he invest to get that interest. So and remember, we were solving for x. And that's why it's important to clearly define what your variable is so you don't forget. X was the 6.75%. Okay, questions on that? Oh. All right. Wait, why, is, why is the second one 8,600? Uh, 8, it's the difference between the first one and 20,000. Oh, good. All right. It's what you had left over after you invested that. All right, uh, so that's the homework for tonight. Um, what I'll do is I'll put a list of topics that are on the test. Um, I'll try to do that right now.